So welcome to the Church of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read from Luke, and I'm going to launch right into this. I'm going to read from Luke, the seventh chapter. A few more verses, maybe, than I normally do, and, but I like these verses. So I'm, I'm not apologizing. I'm just explaining. One of the Pharisees' desire, I'm in verse 36, if, if anyone is going to the scripture. One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. The pronoun he is Jesus Christ, so that we understand the subject is, is the Savior. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And it's important to note that she is identified as a sinner in this account. And it's because her sin was obvious. It's because um, uh, she had a lifestyle of um, sinfulness that everybody knew. Uh, while so many are hidden and so many um, do not necessarily uh, shine their, their in obvious ways, the mistakes made, um, this woman's lifestyle did. So that's why she's identified as such. That's why she's called out as such. That's why she's seen as such. And brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden Jesus Christ, saw it, he bade within himself, thinking within himself, saying, this man if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touched him. For she is a sinner. And there's so much within this, this these verses. I'm not going to pause too often. I'm just going to read to you, but I explain a few as we go. The fact that any one human being would turn to another human being and identify them as a sinner should cause pause in all of us. And yet, we're familiar with this behavior. I wish that it weren't so, but we're familiar, familiar with this behavior. Because we see people who are obvious in their mistakes, in their weaknesses, in their errors, in their sins, and we identify them as such. Yet the word says, we've all come short. So I find that extraordinary before we say anything else. This Pharisee, whom Jesus Christ called out for their falseness, called out for their sin, is calling another a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to thee. Remember that Simon was only thinking these thoughts. He said nothing out loud. So he's about to be called out and may not even know it in the approach that Jesus Christ takes. Master, say on, said Simon. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they both had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. He obviously, he publicly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, and Jesus Christ said unto Simon, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. And she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. I'm using you, but the word says thou, so bear with me. I, 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 if you're reading King James, I am too, but I'm going to soften it down just a bit. You gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, you did not anoint, but this woman anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loves much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. They that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgives Forgive sins also. He said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. 
what you read in this story is so multi-layered. And I have 17 sermons at least out of this, these verses. I'm not going to go to, to 16 of those at least. But I'm going to focus on the fact that there are so many obvious missteps taken by Simon and maybe taken by all of us. I've told this story before. Um, one day I was talking to a young person and he said something very biting. Very, um, yeah, that's good. Very biting. And I said to him, I think along the lines of, you have to be careful in how you speak because your words sound racist. And at that moment, someone walked by that we both knew and he pointed to this person and said, I'm not racist and pointed to him and said, he's racist. And that moment made an impact on me. Because he was Simon in that moment. Simon was saying, I'm not a sinner. She's the sinner. And I'm saying both this young man that I was speaking to and Simon were guilty as charged, but they found one who was guiltier and felt exonerated. And there's two ways we can take our... Um, there's two ways we can take our mind and be misled. We can find those who are worse and feel better than them. We can find those who are better and feel worse than them. And there is no wisdom, no wisdom in comparing ourselves to others. We, fought, we fail when we do so. I remember my first testimony. I was eight years old. I'm not going to recall it today. I'm not going to recant it today. Uh, or not recant it. I'm not going to repeat it today. Um, but I remember it. I was eight years old. I remember uh, the first time I was healed. I felt um, I was injured. The, I prayed, anointed, and I felt God's healing. I remember that moment. I remember when I, um, for the first time ever in my life, 17 years old, I felt called to join the church, give myself up, and I didn't. I waited another year. I remember when I was baptized. I remember even um, the moment, the moment, the moment that I knew Candace was the person for me. And in all of that recall, I'm taken back to a, a, a song I learned as a child, actually the very first song I learned, and maybe the first song you learned as a child in church. When I think of these events I just talked about, testimony, uh, uh, healing as a young person, kind of first things, it also reminds me of the time I remember my parents tucking me in, at the, in bed. Um, I remember when I moved, my parents moved from um, Pompano Beach to West Palm Beach, Florida, 30 miles up the road. And, and um, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Smith, who I had a, a crazy first grade crush on, um, gave me a hug when I left the class for the last time. I remember that feeling. Um, I remember uh, getting my first love note from another first grader, a little girl that I had a crush on. She gave me a little love note. I love you. Do you love me? Check the box. Yes or no. You've also received those notes as well. Again, the same feelings um, are kind of stirred within me that this song that um, I learned um, did and does even to this moment. And I'm, I'm left with the thought, could things be this simple as this song says? I have, um, I would say I spend the majority of my life uh, asking questions. I don't sit in um, confusion. I just challenge everything. I've often said, and I probably said it here, that my favorite question is why? Why? I meet someone who's sad. My first question is why? What's happened? I meet someone who's angry, I mean, filled with rage, and I think, what's happened? I meet someone who's broken. What happened? Why? I hear a statement made, and my first question is, why? It's not that I don't believe the statement. It's not that I don't believe they're sad. It's not that I don't believe they're angry. It's not that I don't believe they're justified. 
I just, I, I want to dig deeper. So I've spent my life in, in delving and digging and, and discovering, uncovering uh, depth, depth, depth each time I, I do this. Um, the Lord says, judge not. So for me to judge not, I want to know the source of the pain. But Jim made a statement last week um, after the, the, the service or during the service. And he said, it's not people. It's just something within them in that moment. We don't, we don't get mad at the people because they're acting out. They're manifesting something within them that has caused this. Um, coming from the, my upbringing, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that at all. Uh, but I had demons that I had to overcome and have worked for my years to do so to find uh, this, this purity that God, or to search for and attempt to find this purity that God is, is um, requiring from us. Love as I have loved you. Wow, what does that mean? How do I get that? Um, how do I uh, achieve that? Tuesday night um, during our service, when we got to the question and answer part, or the, excuse me, just a question and discussion is probably a better way to say that. Part of our, our Tuesday night uh, service, a sister who is um, very grounded in the church, just her comments are always so lovely. And you know that she has this deep love um, and doesn't often question. I was, I was, um, I really enjoyed her question. And she asked, Generally speaking, I'm not going to repeat her question exactly, but she asked, why does God allow this? She talked about something that had happened that was horrifying, that was hard to get through. Why does God allow this? And that's a question I've heard throughout my life and certainly throughout my ministry. Why does God let these things happen? It's my why question. Why does this happen? Um, I'm going to go to the psalm. And I'm going to tell you the difference of a five-year-old learning this and a 65-year-old contemplating this song. And as I say it, you're going to immediately know the song. It starts this way. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. There's more verses. If you if you Google that, you're going to find there's way more verses than I ever learned. Um, so there, the song goes further. But that's enough for this morning. I think as I started to read it, I have little people here whose little eyes lit up and, and probably are repeating the verses in their head, maybe even singing them in their minds right now. Um, but when I was five, I sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, with no question. Today, I don't question him. Today, I question why would he love someone such as me? And so this simple song becomes much different to me today than it was when I was um, innocent and pure and quite candid. Uh, or quite honestly, easier to love in such simplicity. At five years old, six years old, why shouldn't I be loved? Why shouldn't you be loved? Why shouldn't that child be loved? At 65, I've given him a list of reasons that he could hold me in contempt for. For she is a sinner. That could easily be said about anybody who's 65 years old, by the way. I get caught up in, oh, wretched man that I am. I get caught up in, I, I once had a, um, we had a visitor who, who was with us for a couple of years. One day he said to me, we we're sitting at my house having lunch. And he said to me, every Sunday, I don't feel worthy to sit in your meetings. And I said, why? And he said, because everyone there is better than me. And while I spent the next few minutes talking him off of that ledge and telling him why that wasn't necessarily a fact, 
I find myself in that place at times. A wretched man that I am, who am I amongst a people who are so sincere? Jesus loves me, this I know. Sometimes ends with a question mark today at 65 and not an exclamation point. By the way, this is not conflict for me. I don't want anyone to think this is conflict. It just causes pause, that's all. Because I know the end result. I know the end part of this story. He loves me more than I've let him down. I get that. He loves me in spite of me. Uh, one, one, um, one time we were on a, a mission trip and we were in Guatemala. And it was probably the Thursday night before um, our trip began. And everyone was arriving. And so we were in the lobby of this, of this um, hotel, a dark, um, dare I say dank, <laughs> uh, hotel. It was not, it was not uh, a Hampton Inn. It was this little hotel in Guatemala. And we were kind of in the back of the, the lobby. Um, so I don't want you to think it was anything more than this. It was just a few of us sitting around. And as another person would come, I think by the time it was, it was, the evening was done, there were four of us there. Um, so it began with just two of us and then three of us and then four of us. Um, I don't remember everyone, but I remember um, Brother Petey, uh, Jeanette, because um, we're similar in age. I think we're actually the same age and our experiences are similar. And we began to talk about our, our jobs and our failures and our successes and um, our life in, with the Lord and our failures and our successes. And the theme of that night quickly became despite me. And what we found was, despite me, Jesus loves me. So our theme today is, Jesus loves me despite me. And this is my landing spot for this quandary that I could, I could get into. I don't know why. But Jesus loves me. This I know. Again, that's not a reflection on me. That's a reflection on Jesus Christ. When Candace and I were married, she loved me. I know that. I know that. Um, for those of you who are married, and you did the stare down, you faced each other, maybe in the exchange of rings, when, or maybe the exchange of vows, you looked in each other's eyes, um, and you saw love in your, in your partner in that moment. So Candace loved me on April 25th, 1981. I know that. But that was love like a five-year-old sings, Jesus loves me. Today, I look in her eyes, and she still loves me, despite me. Today, she knows me. She knows me for the flawed man that I am. She knows me in all my faults. She knows me in, in all my weaknesses. She knows me in, in uh, she's 40-something years into this. She knows me. And yet, she loves me. And if I believe that, then I believe with all that I am that Jesus loves me. And if I believe that, then I believe this, that Jesus loves you also. I want you to understand that it's not about you. In time, my mom had a, um, and I've told this, I think, before. I just don't know in what format. Not in this context, I know. Um, one time, my mom had a struggle with a, a, um, her schedule. I wanted to visit with a friend who was in need and, and missed for a couple of weeks in being there for her friend in this very um, difficult time. My mom began to apologize and fall all over herself with her friend to apologize. And the friend was not being harsh with her at all. But she said to my mom, Letty, Letty, 
Please don't take this wrong, but you're not that important. This was her attempt, though it sounds very harsh, it was her attempt to let her off the hook, to say, it's okay. I wasn't depending on you. I wasn't depending on your visit. I wasn't depending on your call. That's what she meant by that. And that's the statement that brings me back to accepting that Jesus loves me. Duh, you're not that important. That doesn't mean I'm not important to the Lord. What that means is we are all in this together. That Pharisee who looked at that woman and said, for she is a sinner, was a sinner himself. And so there is no right to call that person worse, but there's also no right to call this person worse. The love of the Savior overcomes our missteps as long as we return to him, humble, meek, begging forgiveness, begging to be reconnected, expressing our love to him spoken to more people lately who have told me something that um, not unique, I'm not that important, but it's something I do as well. And they've said how in each of the times they pray, they tell the Lord, I love you. And if you haven't uh, experienced that, I invite you to whisper to your Savior, I love you. Because in all that he does for us, he whispers to us, Daily, moment to moment, I love you. Take the focus off yourself. Clean your act up. Straighten yourself out. But take the focus off yourself to such degree that you punish yourself. I need you to understand this, says Jesus Christ. I love you. I need you to be able to sing the song you sang when you were five. Jesus loves me. This I know. This I know. I can give you reason after reason after reason after reason to counter that knowledge. But all of that is foolishness. It's hard to understand the love of God. It's hard to understand the love of the Savior. It's hard to understand how one can be so afflicted, so punished, so pained, and from the cross say, Father, forgive them. I often wonder, am I one of those that he said in a sweeping Statement of, of extraordinary love. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when I think that thought, I immediately think, but I do know. And then his sweeping love silences me. Doug, you're not that important. I love you in that you are important. In you thinking you're the worst of the worst is in some twisted way a prideful statement. I'm so important that I'm the worst sinner of all. Hug, silence yourself. From the cross, I forgave. Your sin is not greater than that, but you must return humble. You must return meek, he says to me. You must return broken, he says to me. Go and sin no more, he says to me. I love you. Jesus loves me despite me. Jesus loves you. And when we make claim to that, it's not a statement of pride. It's a statement of humility. But it's a statement of understanding. As we sang when we were five, let us sing when we are and fill in your age. The verse that says, Jesus loves me. This I know. May the Lord bless each one of you.